This brief video highlights various topics incorporated within our four-day blended training workshop on SME and commercial credit assessment. The workshop provides a comprehensive understanding of essential credit assessment principles, concepts, tools, and techniques used for the SME and commercial customer sets. Let's briefly discuss SME and commercial customers' critical role in the global economy. Small and medium enterprises play a significant role in most economies, particularly developing countries. SMEs account for most businesses worldwide and are essential contributors to job creation and global economic development. SMEs represent around 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. Formal SMEs contribute up to 40% of national GDP in emerging economies. When informal SMEs are included, these numbers increase significantly. According to the World Bank's estimates, 600 million jobs will need to be created by 2030 to absorb the growing global workforce, making SME development a high priority for many governments worldwide. In emerging markets, most formal jobs are created by SMEs, which create 4 out of 10 jobs. Access to finance is a fundamental constraint on SME growth. In emerging markets and developing economies, financing access is the second most cited obstacle facing SMEs trying to grow their businesses. SMEs are less likely to obtain bank loans than large firms. Instead, SMEs must rely upon internal funds or cash from family and friends when trying to launch or initially run their businesses. So why should or why do financial institutions target the SME and commercial customer sets? As mentioned, in most countries, SMEs represent a significant portion of all economic activity. Thus, governments consider SMEs central to their economic growth. Consequently, commercial banks are gradually moving towards financing SMEs because large companies are increasingly funded through the bond and equity markets that provide more significant amounts and longer terms which banks find challenging to match. As a result, large corporate lending departments are becoming a rarity in commercial banks. Why is it advantageous for banks to target SMEs? The overall size of the SME market is enormous. Thus, there are a lot of potential customers, many of whom may be unbanked, underbanked, or poorly served by the larger commercial banks. SMEs tend not to be price sensitive. That is, SMEs tend to be more concerned about access to finance than the cost of the funding. As a result, SMEs tend to be loyal customers. Once an SME is working with a bank, there is a reluctancy to move to another bank. The overall relationship with the SME can be robust. Since individuals own many SMEs, they can be targeted, as can their supply chains. Thus, banks can provide an array of banking services the SMEs require, thereby aiming at the client's whole wallet. Since we have spoken about advantages and opportunities of targeting the SME customer sets, let's discuss some challenges or drawbacks. The size of loans tend to be small. Thus, banks earn less money and higher interest rates won't make up the difference. Running a profitable SME banking business unit requires controlling operating costs and obtaining the customer's other banking business. SMEs Default rates tend to be higher than large corporate clients, requiring banks to establish red flags and proactively monitor the situation. Banks must work with their SME clients to resolve issues before they become problems. Implementing such a strategy without increasing operating costs or being accused of acting as a shadow director is problematic. Often, the solution involves modifying or simplifying the protocol to manage SME businesses and reduce costs. Regrettably, the business unit structure frequently reflects the legacy of large corporate banking. 
Thus, implementing a practical approach may require modifications to the bank's existing organization structure and operating model. Due to their limited resources, SMEs can frequently not invest in costly systems and processes, resulting in poor or questionable data. For an example, up-to-date audited accounts are a rarity. SME owners and managers are frequently more preoccupied with marketing and margins than maintaining robust data. This absence of quality data means bankers must cope with inadequate financial information while managing relationships and protecting the bank's position. Penetrating the SME market profitably and sustainably involves training the bank front office and risk management staff to understand the challenges and identify and mitigate risk while responding to SME requirements professionally and quickly. Thus, success will require a blend of empathy mixed with an appropriate amount of hard-nosed objectivity and honesty. We present practical tools that support the lenders serving the SME and commercial customer sets within the workshop. Core themes that run throughout the course include how can we effectively assess and monitor credit worthiness at a loan's inception and during the annual review process, evaluation protocols that enable lenders to assess credit requests professionally, the importance of cash flow analysis and other practical tools to assess a borrower's ability to service debt, and loan structuring tools that protect and preserve a financial institution's position. The program contains four modules. Each module consists of a remote session and e-learning activities. Participants can discuss topics and concerns during the remote instructor-led sessions, exchange thoughts, share experiences with the instructor and peers, and receive constructive feedback in a supportive environment. The remote instructor-led sections are supplemented by e-learning activities consisting of videos, handout, quizzes that improve understanding and retention. The workshop reveals our experience in delivering similar courses in Asia, the Caribbean and Central America, Europe and Central Asia, North Africa and the Middle East, North America, and Sub-Sahara Africa. Early in the workshop, we discussed the importance of a mutual definition of creditworthiness. Creditworthiness is a measurement of a borrower's ability and willingness or intentions to repay its obligations. The analysis focuses on the borrower's financial resources, internal and external, and management's intention or willingness to repay its obligations. Both elements are required to assure payback. If a borrower is willing to repay but cannot repay, you will lose money. Likewise, if a borrower can repay but is unwilling to repay, you will lose money. With this understanding, we address an effective protocol to evaluate credit requests and various tools and concepts to enable lenders to perform a robust assessment quickly and professionally. The evaluation process we emphasize consists of four distinct steps. Those steps are assessing the loan purpose, evaluating the industry and business, assessing management, reviewing and analyzing the financial statements. This sequencing is not provided randomly. Instead, the sequencing enhances the lender's efficiency and effectiveness. The first step is to assess the purpose of the loan. If the purpose of the loan does not make sense or if the purpose of the loan violates your institution's policy, there is no need to assess the industry, business, management, and the financial statements. Likewise, if the industry assessment indicates the industry is not viable, is in decline, or is overly competitive, there may be little reason or benefit to assess management or the financial statements. You will note that the last step in the evaluation process is reviewing the financial statements because a comprehensive assessment of the financial statements requires a sound understanding of the loan purpose, industry and business, and management. Following the prescribed procedure enhances the lender's efficiency while ensuring a robust assessment. 
Thus, this procedure enables lenders to conclude more rapidly which application or applicant is worthy of further consideration and which is not. This procedure helps the lender get to know as quickly as possible. While this may seem callous, this is an example of the previously discussed required hard-nosed objectivity and honesty. Also, as an owner of more than one SME, I will say that if a financial institution declines my credit request, I would want to be advised sooner rather than later. After all, there are other financial institutions in the market that may be willing or keener to respond to my request. In presenting cash flow analysis, we discuss the profitability trap concept, the importance of liquidity, and how the lack of liquidity, not profitability, drives a company to default and declare bankruptcy. The profitability trap occurs when we equate financial health with profits. In presenting the profitability trap, we ask participants to consider the cash impact of an increase in inventory or an overinvestment in inventory, an increase in accounts receivable or slowing accounts receivable payments, and an overinvestment in property, plant, and equipment. Each of the reference transactions impacts cash. Each transaction results in a use of cash. However, None of the transactions are reflected on the income statement. Since these transactions are not captured on the income statement, they do not impact profitability. We stress the importance of cash flow analysis because it isolates how these and many other transactions impact a company's cash position or liquidity. That is, cash flow analysis discloses how a company generates cash, cash inflows, and uses cash, cash outflows. Though a company's profitability is essential when evaluating investment alternatives, from a lender's perspective, liquidity is more important than profitability. Thus, performing cash flow analysis enables lenders to avoid the profitability trap because they can determine if the company is taking in enough cash to meet its cash obligations which is the fundamental indicator of adequate liquidity. We stress that companies go bankrupt because they do not have the cash to pay their bills, not because they are unprofitable. In the workshop, we present the direct cash flow statement because it effectively highlights how a company generates cash, how a company uses cash, and how much cash does the company generate from its core business. We recommend the use of the direct cash flow statement because it enables the lender to assess a company's ability to pay financing costs and maturing debt with cash generated from its core business, a company's borrowing requirements, the financing used by a company, and the appropriateness of the financing used by the company. We highlight the objective of loan structuring. That is, the aim is to enable a borrower to repay thus contributing to the borrower's designation as creditworthy. We discuss loan structuring concepts and tools such as lending rationales, loan terms and conditions, and loan covenants during the workshop. Lending rationales are essential loan structuring tools used to answer various crucial questions. For an example, what is the purpose of the loan? What is the source of repayment? How will the loan be repaid? What are the risks inherent in the situation? What is the appropriate loan structure? These are fundamental questions or challenges that retail, SME, commercial, and corporate lenders encounter when assessing loan requests. The lending rationales provide lenders with an approach or protocol in determining the critical issues or concerns. Besides, lending rationales offer a practical approach for gathering information, identifying and addressing issues, organizing the assessment of the credit request, and structuring the analysis. As one assesses and understands the loan purpose, the source of repayment, the unique risks, and the required protection and control needed to shield lenders from possible future losses become apparent. We also discuss loan structuring tools that lenders use. For an example, lenders work with loan tenor, and other terms and conditions. 
The most common terms and conditions include interest rates and payment terms. Within reason, a lender can adjust the loan tenor to enhance the borrower's ability to repay, which is a central criterion for creditworthiness. However, the lender's use of this tool, loan tenor, is restricted by the financial institution's policy regarding loan tenor. Whereas loan tenor enables the borrower to be classified as creditworthy, the other terms and conditions are primarily designed to protect and preserve the financial institution's interest and position. Loan covenants are essential loan structuring tools that protect and preserve the financial institution's rights and position throughout the loan. Once a loan is dispersed, leverage changes hands. Before the loan disbursement, the lender has significant control. Power changes hands after the funds are distributed. The borrower gains greater control or influence. Thus, covenants are used to maintain the lender's position and control after loan disbursement. We demonstrate how covenants are used to influence disclosure of information, maintenance of the borrower's financial condition, and various borrower-specific risks and concerns. During the remote session, participants have the chance to discuss, design, and selectively recommend loan covenants to protect a financial institution's position. While no lender intends to make a bad loan, all lending institutions should anticipate having some level of problem loans and loan losses. Problem loans are a byproduct of the lending process. If an institution is going to lend money, it should expect some problem loans. Financial institutions' challenge is keeping the problem loans within reasonable or manageable limits. The workshop provides an overview of various issues and challenges regarding the management of problem loans and a framework designed to help SMA and commercial lenders manage problem loans. During the workshop, we explore how problem loans are managed within the market, how financial institutions oversee the problem loan management process, and whether some techniques and procedures enable financial institutions and their lenders to manage the process more professionally. Though information may not yet be on the front pages, banking professionals, regulators, international financial institutions, and development finance institutions see and understand the impact of COVID-19 on the portfolios of financial institutions globally. Furthermore, as the stimulus and relief packages expire, the extent of the COVID-19 impact on the financial institutions' portfolios and government budgets will become more quantifiable. Seasoned lenders and entrepreneurs understand that economic turbulence and macroeconomic shocks or ongoing market occurrences which will result in financial institutions being exposed to upsurges in non-performing loans. This undeniable and unavoidable fact is particularly challenging in markets lacking a long history in problem loan management. Thus, assessing requests and effectively monitoring and managing credit risk is central to lending profitably and sustainably to the SME and commercial customer sets. Thank you for viewing this video. Our goal was to outline the topics presented and the pragmatic approach used. If you want to learn more about this and other training programs offered by GBRW, do not hesitate to get in touch with us and we will respond promptly. Thank you very much.